Good evening, everyone. This is Hell's Unicorn once again. Previously, I had made an announcement that I was going to be delving into some different subjects than my usual fare, and without further ado, here we go. The individual depicted in this image that you now see before you, this lovely lady, is that of Larissa McComas, a prominent B-movie actress and pinup model from the 1990s and early 2000s. I myself was a fan of her work during that period, which culminated from my mid-teens to my early 20s. Over the course of the past couple of years, I had decided to follow up on past interests in her life and her work, and had found that it had stopped roughly around the time of late 2001. And then it was later revealed uh, through a number of links on the internet that she had actually passed away in November of 2009, apparently either of illness or of suicide. At the time that I fa had found this out, I had concluded that this was simply the explanation that she had passed at age 38 in Melbourne, Florida, and that was simply all there was to it, and that the true story would not be known. A couple months ago, I decided to start digging a bit deeper, and I noticed that there were conflicting information being represented in the obituaries dedicated to her versus the statements on her official website and on other various blogs that had sourced her website. And it has now since come to my attention that the actual place of her passing was in fact Waverly, Virginia, not Melbourne, Florida, and that she had not lived in Melbourne, Florida for the better part of five years. During the time period from when her creative material of various genres had ceased, there were a number of events that occurred that are chronicled in one of the links down below in the description. Uh, the name of the blog is A Joe's Eye View, and the name of the articles, there are actually two of them, it's a two-parter, are The Larissa McComas Saga, an, unfair, an Unfit Parent or a Victim of Conservative Justice, and there is a second part to it that is linked right below it. About half of the information in this article, which was actually originally intended for local print, is inaccurate. And it's inaccurate primarily based on information that was kept out of the media because of the extenuating circumstances at the time. There were a number, a number of things going on at the time that nobody was privy to. And I have only since become privy to them in the course of a little less than a month through conversations with someone that knew Larissa quite well, an individual by the name of David Keeter, who actually has a YouTube account and also a Google Plus ID. I've had two phone discussions with him and also numerous email interchanges, and I am going to read some of the material from these emails to you, and then afterwards I am going to relay some of what I learned through the two phone conversations that I've had with him. The first email contact that I had with him was based on a post that he made on another blog titled Lord Dixie's Dark Domain, and I have a link to this in the description as well. And this is what prompted my further research. There are 10 points listed on this post that I'm going to read for you right now and so reads by David Keeter. I can give you the facts, but so far you haven't published my email, so I don't know if I'm wasting my time. I'll start with this. Now, the backstory behind this is that uh, David had attempted to send an email, and then he later relayed to me in his first email that there was some kind of a glitch or a mistake on his end, and that's why the information was not communicated directly to Lord Dixie at the time. Uh, this post was dated August 26th of 2012. First, Larissa died November 3rd, 2009 in Waverly, Virginia, not Melbourne, Florida. 
If any of you go to the Wikipedia page that's dedicated to her or go to her home website, her de place of death is listed as Melbourne, Florida. This is false. She did pass away in Waverly, Virginia. Second, her at the time, quote unquote, on again, off again, but actually ex-husband Doug was at home with her and not at work. He had Larissa call in for him to say he was sick. Truth was he was too drunk because he was drinking all night and yelling at Larissa. His place of employment was Glens, Texaco in Waverly, Virginia. To give you a little bit of a backstory, the individual named Doug is the ex-husband of Larissa McComas, and I have it on good authority both from David and also from family of Larissa's that Doug was an abusive alcoholic. He was at the time Larissa's manager, both in her print model and movie career. And it has basically been relayed to me by David that Doug had a habit of drinking down two to three cases of Miller Lite a day and not getting up from his chair after, be, after feeling no pain and often soiling himself. Point three, the weapon used was a Mossberg 12 gauge that Doug kept at his side. Contrary to what those of you have heard, Larissa McComas did not die of disease, nor did she kill herself using pills. The actual cause of death was a shotgun blast to the head. I have this confirmed from the Waverly Police Department. I am still waiting to get the incident report released from them, but this has been confirmed to me. The rest of what is listed on here is stuff that I am reliant totally on David for. Four, Larissa didn't know how to use a pump shotgun. Five, Doug changed his alibi three times within four hours. According to David, these were the three different alibis that he used. First, that he was not in the room when this occurred. Two, that he was in the room and then proceeded to try to stop her while she was in the act but failed. And three, that he was too drunk to remember what happened and it blacked out and woke up to her corpse. If anybody here can square these three radically different scenarios with the truth and that they're not in contradiction with each other, please tell me so. But to me, my BS meter is working overtime. Six, Rennett, uh, this is Larissa McComas's brother who was suffering from AIDS, committed suicide two days later using methadone that he stole from his sister for her addiction to pain medication. Larissa McComas had an addiction to Oxycontin. This runs contrary to most of the stories running around the internet that Rennett had also shot himself or that both he and Larissa had killed themselves with pain medication. Rennett was the only one who killed himself with pain medication. The jury is definitely out on whether or not Larissa actually killed herself. Seven, Larissa had asked Doug to leave her. That's why she left Florida, but he followed her to Virginia. Let me give you a little background on this based on what Doug, uh, David has relayed to me. Doug accepted divorce papers from Larissa and Larissa and David Keeter had actually set up arrangements to be married and they were engaged. My confirmation for this is that the first time that I phoned David to speak to him, he let the phone ring so I could hear the voicemail greeting and it was her voice answering saying, hello, you have reached the residence of Larissa and David. Larissa has a very very distinctive voice. For anyone that has seen her in any of her movies, it is very difficult to mistake her for somebody else. So that alone is confirmation enough for me, although additional facts were disclosed to me that led me to trust David Keeter's testimony even further. Continuing, 
Part 8. After the police declared the death a suicide, Doug disappeared. His whereabouts are still unknown. Add a caveat to this. Doug put one of Larissa McComas's dresses on auction on eBay about four or five months ago, and it is widely stipulated that he is still in control of her website, although nobody knows exactly where he is right now, but he disappeared soon after this happened. Nine, the suicide note that Larissa had written that they found at the scene was four years old at the time of her death, written in Florida and not Virginia, and Doug had kept it. Ten, Larissa was cremated by Doug, but Doug refused to let her family have the ashes so that she could be buried next to her mother and father in Waverly, Virginia, her last request since her parents' passing in 2001. 2001. In addition to these 10 points, he says as follows. Lord Dixie, I can go on. I can give you dates, names of witnesses, and even the serial number of the shotgun used. The only problem is, will you post it? Also, Gary is a thief. He didn't track down the videos. He stole them right before they fired him and he crashed their computers. Now, for those of you that are interested, the individual that he's referring to named Gary posted several posts on Lord Dixie's Dark Domain blog under the pseudonym Mars Revealer. Since posting a number of these individual posts, he has retracted several of them so that they can't be read. I don't recall everything that was said, but several of the things that were said and some of the things that were said that are still online point to several things that David had told me about this particular individual, which was that he was a bottom feeder, that he took both Larissa and Doug for a lot of money, he was a pervert, and he was also Larissa's Oxycontin dealer. So if you read anything by Mars Revealer, you'll notice A, that he is very self-congratulatory, and B, that his grasp of the English language is awful. It's a challenge to read through the massive pile of grammatic and syntax errors that are on here. Now, Continuing on with information that David Keeter relayed to me via email. I will not read the entire emails, but I will read the salient points. <clears throat> I am very pleased to know that Larissa still has fans out there of a high caliber such as yourself. He's referring to me here. As far as the story goes, it'll be a long one. I also was a huge fan of Larissa's, which turned into friendship, which in turn led to even more all over a period of almost 16 years. We had just started our life together and she was doing well, very well. She had high hopes both for her private life and professional. She had renewed old contacts who were still interested in her acting talent. She was under professional and doctor care for her addiction to pain pills, that's Oxycontin, and by her own will had it under control. More importantly, she had left Florida and the people who were abusing her, AKA Doug, and several other characters in this unfortunate drama. All of this was done by her own initiative. I take no credit. I was only honored by the fact that she chose me to start this new path with. Then things went bad, again. Not between us, but all around us. That story will come to you soon. It's still very hard for me to talk about it. In truth, I'm still in therapy over it. But I promise you, we'll get it along with the documented facts to prove it. Meanwhile, if you wish to contact the Waverly Police Department in Waverly, Virginia, they may give you the incident report regarding her death, including Doug's questionable answer as to how his fingerprints were on the shotgun and powder burns were on his hands. I would like to add to this that according to David's testimony, Larissa's fingerprints were not on the gun. I can't confirm this as of yet because the Waverly Police Department has not gotten back to me yet with the incident report. I will be calling them again tomorrow and I will be sending a letter to them every Tuesday on the week until I get at least some, if not all, of the incident report. 
Now, continuing on to the next email. I'll share something private with you. Larissa did not have RS dystrophy. For those of you that are not aware, RS dystrophy is an extremely rare condition that usually affects the extremities, specifically the arms and the legs. According to the primary source uh, for the drama that had gone on in Florida, which is the Joe's Eye View blog, Larissa was suffering from RS dystrophy and that she and she was wheelchair bound. This information is also false, but this information was provided by Larissa because she did not want to disclose that she had a very bad prescription drug addiction and that while she was trying to get herself off the pills, she was experiencing extreme pain, not all that dissimilar from what a heroin addict goes through when your muscles tense up. It's not uncommon for narcotic addicts to experience pain to the point where they need aid walking during the harshest of withdrawal symptoms. But continuing on, when she didn't have any uh, Oxycontin, her muscles would tighten and cramp just like a heroin addict. Her people, in quotation marks, in Florida would keep her doped up and robbed, rob her blind. That crazy Gary person on Lord Dixie's site was her drug dealer. I had known Larissa since 1993 and had been a fan since 1991. After her mother died, Larissa was not the same. Members of her family, close friends, including myself, couldn't reach her mentally. It allowed for the lower element to use and abuse her. I tried to stay in contact but rarely was able to speak with her directly. Finally, around 2004, Larissa contacted me asking for help, both financially and emotionally. When I arrived, it was like walking into a drug hornet's nest. Her request was simple. Get me out. How could anyone say no to that? I'll address your questions and more very soon. Hopefully, it'll go through this time. Thanks for believing in Larissa, and you're right. It wasn't suicide. The next email. Here we go. To continue with question one, Larissa and I would travel constantly back and forth to Florida all the time through 2005 and 2006. She actually was spending more time here in Virginia than she was in Florida. The main reason we would go back to Florida was because of Tristan, her son. Whether it be for court or for visitation, we were constantly on the road. It was during this time in 2006 that, Doug, that Larissa asked Doug for a divorce, which he agreed to. Doug was an abusive alcoholic with a two-case-a-day Miller Lite habit. He would actually soil himself in his chair instead of getting up and going to the bathroom. I sat in his chair one day and had to change my pants. One time during visitation with Tristan, Larissa lost it. She loved Tristan more than anyone or anything. I asked the people at Child Services what could Larissa and I do to get Tristan back. We told them that we were now together and that Larissa had asked for a divorce from Doug. They responded by locking the door and we had an emergency meeting. The solution was simple. Larissa was not the problem. Doug was. I heard them say it with my own two ears. If Larissa and I would marry, move to Virginia, buy a home, not rent, and produce an educational plan for Tristan, then they would contact Virginia Social Services, and if we passed, we could have Tristan back. Needless to say, we went to work. Larissa was happy, and the Larissa from old emerged to take charge. It was a sight to see, and the people in Florida had no clue as to what was happening. We had agreed to secrecy, seeing how it was Larissa's friends who had Tristan taken away the first time, so we weren't going to give them a second chance. Only Larissa. The house was a two-story brick colonial just outside of Waverly. Once we closed and Larissa had Virginia residency, she was eligible for drug treatment. Not only did she apply, it was her idea, and she started a treatment plan. There were some rough nights, sleepless nights, but she refused to give up. The prize was too great. That's all she could think of about that and the fact that she was now pregnant with our child. The next email. Other than you, Jim Winorski, he was a director in B, B Cinema that Larissa had worked with frequently, 
Lord Dixie and Larissa's Aunt Phyllis, I haven't talked to anyone. Trust me, if you think what I've told you so far is intense, you haven't seen anything yet. Also, I spoke to Larissa's Aunt Phyllis last night and told her of your interest. I have since spoken with Phyllis, and um, I have basically more or less gotten her blessing on disclosing all of this, although I have been requested uh, to keep certain more intimate details to myself, and I'm going to do as such. Moving on to the next email. Let's see here. Since we've started this, I went back to Lord Dixie's site and noticed that Gary has retracted some of his comments to me. Not too surprising, but it does delete some evidence that could have been use useful. And then from there was the first request uh, for a phone call. This occurred on uh, the 26th of uh, January this year, and I proceeded to phone him uh, not too long after. I think it was some point in early February, February 1st or 2nd, I can't remember the exact date, but anyway, everything kind of falls into a specific timeline so that the pieces fit together well with what is being disclosed in a general sense on a Joe's Eye view, one of the sources that I listed. However, one of the things that's not disclosed in a Joe's Eye view was the fact that David and Larissa had successfully won custody of Tristan back for a time and that he was up in Virginia with them. And the reason why this wasn't disclosed was because child services and both Larissa and David kept it quiet so that the people that had extorted Larissa at the tune of more than a million dollars she ended up losing her house in Melbourne, Florida as a result, would not know about what was going on. Continuing to the next email. First, let me say yes. Jim was talking about Doug. This was in regard to a forum post that Jim Winorski actually made where he referred to Doug as her on-again, off-again husband slash boyfriend. Jim never liked him, but legalities, you know. He can't say who he was talking about, afraid of being sued. But Doug doesn't have a pot to piss in, which means he's dirt poor. Second, I was arrested February 13th, 2007, taken from my shop after a great morning with Larissa at our home. You're right again on this matter. Doug came to Virginia after my arrest into our home and put Larissa back to work in a escort business against my wishes and complaint. And we'll talk about that on the phone. For all of you that are wondering how a woman like the one that you're seeing in this image ends up with a piece of garbage like Doug, it's difficult to fathom. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around it. But to give you an inkling of where I think and where David thinks this comes from is part of the plot line to the movie Casino with Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro. Sharon Stone's character has a loser pimp boyfriend who is portrayed by James Woods. Robert De Niro basically sums up their relationship as this. Sharon, is taking, uh, Sharon Stone's character is taking care of him because nobody else would. Some point back in the beginning when Larissa and Doug first met, he may well have been a different person or his alcoholism may not have fully manifested. But nevertheless, according to David's testimony to me, by the time the early 2000s came around, Doug was an abusive, drunken idiot. And combined with the shock of her parents' death and the addiction, the drug addiction that she had developed to Oxycontin, she suffered all kinds of abuse at his hands and at the hands of other bottom feeders over the course of several years. In essence, Larissa McComas's naive, 
good-natured, trusting personality proved to be her greatest enemy. Now, with regards to the uh, particular thing mentioned in the email regarding David Keeter being arrested, David Keeter owned a gun shop in Waverly, Virginia. It's your typical mom-and-pop operation. Government regulated, so people are keeping tabs on him. On February 13th of 2007, a straw purchase occurred outside of David's gun shop that he was not privy to, but apparently the ATF had been keeping tabs on his shop and proceeded to arrest him and put him in prison for over two years on a misdemeanor charge. The maximum sentence for a gun misdemeanor to the tune of what happened here is not more than six months. I had conversations with David about this and it came to my attention that there was a long-standing vendetta with a few members of the ATF or at least this was his suspicion based on a botched attempt at finding him guilty on supposed gun running charges dating back to the 80s during the whole Contra thing down in South America which he was not involved in. He knew people that were involved in it but just like what happened in Ruby Ridge when he was approached by the ATF and told to squeal and become an informant he did no such thing. And like in the case of Ruby Ridge, he won in court. One of the things that you never want to do, ladies and gentlemen, when you're dealing with a corrupt police force, either federal or state, is win in court. Because they will never let you hear the end of it. And it is the opinion of this person speaking right now that the ATF had a hand in Larissa McComas's death by taking away the only protection that she had from the unfortunate contacts that she made while she was in the business that she was in. This is the extent of what I know and what I can provide so far with regards to the facts. And some of these facts naturally are not fully confirmed because I don't have the necessary paperwork that goes with them. I am currently working on that and as soon as I have those in my possession I will be posting them. But suffice to say my research and my experience in the past lead me to believe that Larissa McComas was a very beautiful, very charming and a very good-natured woman who made a few bad choices in Friends and suffered greatly for it. I think that the government's policy as it stands regarding a number of things that have happened to her and to others around her are symptomatic of a larger problem that this country has with respecting the rights of individuals and understanding that there are some moral points in society where it's better to keep your hands off even if you find it morally repugnant. Speaking for myself just in reaction to a point made by uh, the blogger on a Joe's Eye View, I don't think that the line between pornography and er erotica is as clear-cut as you make it out to be. However, I will say, in defense of Larissa, that a number of the questionable images floating around on the internet are actually photoshopped by another one of her supposed friends. At no point during Larissa's career did she engage in anything that could be considered hardcore without the influence of Rohypnol. This is something else that I've had confirmed from David. And on top of that, most of the more questionable aspects of her career were contingent upon 
compulsion by her deadbeat husband, Doug. What I have said has been told to me largely in confidence from David, and I've had his blessing to reveal this much. There are other things, more specific details, that I am not going to divulge. It is my hope that through this blog and others that will follow, and I am going to try to interview David in real time at some later juncture, that the truth will come out. And that ultimately, whoever is responsible for what has happened here, and I have very strong suspicions based on what I've heard, that things happened a certain way, but I'm not going to say anything at this juncture on that. That those who have followed her career and those who took an interest, uh, particularly in her personally, will know the truth. And the truth, as I see it, is simple. She did not die in Melbourne, Florida. She was not just some random porno star statistic, the way several websites seem to have indicated, but was rather most likely the victim of foul play. She did not die of a drug overdose. She did not die of a disease. And I am 99.9% .9 sure that she did not die of a self-inflicted gunshot blast. Others hopefully will follow suit and continue to dig. But for the time being, it looks like myself and a few other people that I've spoken to are the only ones talking about this. And the reason why I decided to bring this up on this channel is because A, it has the most visibility, and there is a strong likelihood that at least some of you in my audience know who she was and may or may not know about some of the uh, stuff floating around the internet that has cropped up in the aftermath of her death. But I also wanted to do this as a service to those that followed her career and who have questions. And I invite all who, who see this to comment on it. I just ask you to be respectful and to reserve judgment until the facts come out. Normally, I'm of a mind to allow people to pontificate on subjects of morality and faith, but here I really don't want to hear about it. I just want to focus on the truth of what's happened here and to try to get to the bottom of this. So anyway, that pretty much does it for this juncture. I went pretty long on this one. And please feel free if you have any questions to ask me, and I will respond as quickly as I can. Until next time, with prudence to myself and benevolence to all of you, good evening.